If you read, watch, or listen to any review of any big budget popular game, there is one word that I bet you is going to come up more than any other description or any other comment, and that word is immersive. Cyberpunk 2077? Immersive. The Last of Us? Immersive. Red Dead Redemption? You betcha. No matter where you look or who you talk to, someone, somewhere, is going to be going on about how immersive their favourite game is. From Bioshock to Bubsy 3D. And that's… kind of a problem, because whilst we in gaming circles might love to call games immersive, it's pretty difficult for us to agree on what exactly immersion even is. What's more, it's a terrible word for what we're actually describing. At no point has anyone who's been immersed in a video game ever thought that they were actually inside of it, as much as I wish that could be the case. In fact, the only thing we can know for sure is that immersion has become a bit of a marketing buzzword. If a game looks gorgeous, is polished to a mirror shine, and is built on a foundation of dead developers, then we're told it's immersive and that that's a good thing, without really knowing why. This has bugged me for literally years. Immersion is one of the fundamental joys of playing video games, but without being able to properly articulate and explain it, we're left unable to properly appreciate it. Whilst $100 million games with full voice acting, custom animations, and gorgeous environments are very good at selling a particular fantasy and a rich, detailed world, sky-high production values aren't the only way to create an immersive experience. And if I'm being honest, it's not even the best way. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Over my holidays, I got stuck into a load of great immersive games of all shapes and sizes, to try and explain the concept in a way that makes sense, and to work out some of the most creative ways video games can immerse us without needing to spend so much money on immersion that you kind of forget to make a video game. So, what is immersion? Well, I think it's less of a state of mind or a particular mechanic within games, and more of an ongoing process, through which we can forge a deeper connection with certain games over time. The more immersed we are in a game, the more in sync we are with it, meaning that our discoveries feel more meaningful, we're better able to sympathise with the characters, and the developer's vision for the game is communicated more clearly. Because immersion isn't a simple on or off binary, it can come from a variety of places, and various factors can add to or take away from how immersed we are. In Shadow of Mordor, and its eh, follow-up, Shadow of War, the way the bad guy orcs take on different personalities and develop rivalries adds a great sense of depth to the world. But when I got further into the game and realised that a lot of their personalities and upgrades were fairly simplistic, if not outright random, they stopped being characters anymore and instead became blocks of stats and traits with ugly faces. My immersion had been broken, and I stopped enjoying the game anywhere near as much. Once a player's immersion has been broken, it can be very difficult for a game to win back their trust. This is why games have to be extra careful not to break the spell they have over players in order for them to reap the benefits that a heightened level of immersion can bring. But how do games do that? Well, as far as I can work out, there are three main sources of immersion. Sometimes your immersion can be traced back to one, and sometimes all three. But usually immersion comes in one of these forms. Spatial immersion, that being immersion that comes from coherent and evocative world design. Narrative immersion, which is immersion that comes from putting you in the shoes of a particular character or getting you immersed in the story. And finally, mechanical immersion, or immersion that comes from a strong attachment to a particular gameplay loop or set of mechanics. Let's start with that first one, because I think it's what people most associate with a feeling of immersion, and that makes it a good place to start. Spatial immersion comes from our enjoyment of playing in an environment with a genuine sense of place that feels, if not realistic, then at least believable. A good set of examples can be found in a set of games that are fittingly named Immersive Sims. For those who don't know, Immersive Sims are a genre of games that include Deus Ex, Dishonored, Hitman, and a bunch of others. They're generally action games that are unique in the fact that they focus on player agency and a heavy use of systemic mechanics. The result of this is that immersive sim worlds feel alive. They aren't just a set of static, artificial challenges waiting for a player to come along, but living, breathing environments with a genuine sense of reality. Warren Spector, formerly of Looking Glass, the studio responsible for System Shock, Thief, and Ultima Underworld, describes them as creating a feeling that you are there and that nothing stands between you and the belief that you're in an alternate world. I find the most important part of creating a believable environment is to give it the impression that it exists independently of the player, even if it obviously doesn't. And the way immersive sims do this is to create a multitude of small environmental stories that add texture and depth to the world but aren't part of the main narrative. 
In Dishonored 2, all the levels, particularly those set in residential areas, are filled with little conversations and stories playing out all around you. In the game's second level, there's a black market which sells ammo, upgrades, and gear. It's a classic video game shop, right? Well, not entirely. Through a bit of digging around, you can find out the shopkeeper's name, Horatio Weatherby, go to his house, and learn he's hiring an assistant after the last one died under mysterious circumstances. Later on, you can find the aforementioned assistant in a bloodfly-infested apartment, learn that he was fired for objecting to the bribes his boss gave the cops, and steal his spare key, allowing you to rob the old man's shop. Suddenly, a generic video game NPC has a name, opinions of his own, and even exists in a semi-functioning economy, breathing life into an otherwise tropey video game staple. Dishonored isn't the only game that pulls this off. In Prey, the Talos-1 space station has a complete manifest of its entire 250-person strong crew, and there's a very long side quest involving finding where each of the deceased crew members ended up dying, checking in on the ones that managed to survive, and figuring out which ones have turned into scary phantoms. The fact that every NPC has a name, a job, and usually a little environmental story associated with them gives the world of Prey a fantastic lived-in quality that makes it much more interesting to explore. Of course, another way to make a space immersive is to pile on some realism. There is no quicker way to build a feeling of immersion than to convince players that the environment they're running around in could plausibly exist, and nothing breaks your immersion faster than realising that the world you're playing in doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Even if it has become a bit of a played out trope, the idea that you can spot a mountain on the horizon and then climb it lends an environment an excellent sense of scale in a way that you could never achieve by having the two places separated by a loading screen or worse yet, a massive invisible wall. Death Stranding's overworld is massive, lifeless, and boring, so terribly boring, but because it forces you to hoof it across the terrain and navigate everywhere entirely under your own power, the geography of post-Kojima America takes on a character of its own, and makes the grand odysseys you take feel much more rewarding and immersive as a result. Similarly, a commitment to maintaining a sense of immersion over balance is why Monster Hunter goes through the effort of having monsters fight each other whenever they cross paths, because it would feel weird if these giant killing machines just sort of ignored each other. The same goes for Far Cry and its bevy of wild animals. They're not on anyone's side, so it would challenge a player's sense of immersion if they only ever focused on the player. Even little tiny touches to the behaviour of NPCs and the way we're made to interact with the world goes a long way towards building a sense of immersion. In Divinity Original Sin 2, if you hang out near rotten fish, you'll become stinky and people will like you less. In RimWorld, all of the characters, even animals and enemies, need to eat and sleep, and the way Animal Crossing villagers all have preferred hobbies, styles, and speech patterns goes a long way towards making them feel like distinct characters, even if there's only like, eight different personality types in the whole game. Which brings me on to Narrative Immersion. Narrative immersion is all about creating a story that the player has genuine investment in beyond wanting to see how it ends, or putting you in a particular character's shoes. In mystery games, this is really easy to do. Paradise Killer, Disco Elysium, and Heaven's Vault, to name just a few, are great at immediately getting the player invested in their story, because you have to develop an intimate understanding of the characters, setting, and themes in order to progress. For example, early on in Paradise Killer, the game makes it very clear that the big central murder happened behind a series of magically locked doors, and they could only be opened by understanding the layout of the island as well as the background lore of the game, meaning that it's only by going above and beyond to immerse yourself in Island 24 that you can solve the puzzles and crack the code. When you do eventually reach the murder scene, your passion is rewarded with some bombshell evidence that totally turns the case upside down, which of course, I won't spoil. If you don't care enough about the game to go after this optional puzzle, then you won't be able to get the best verdict, leaving the game to suggest you explore the world a bit more and get to know the various characters in order to solve those last few elusive mysteries. Companion characters are another way that games can get you invested in their stories, though this has to be done carefully. A poorly implemented escort character, for example, can often end up breaking your immersion as they force you to play in a way that isn't much fun and feels unnatural, not to mention the fact that you'll probably end up despising the character in question. On the other hand, well-executed companions can offer a great window into the game and an emotional anchor to the story. Atreus from God of War and Ellie from The Last of Us are two great examples, because not only are they broadly useful and likeable, they're also well positioned to ask all of the important world-building questions that we as players want answered. In addition, most people naturally want to protect children, allowing us to easily step into the role of Daddy Kratos and Joel respectively in a nice bit of ludo-narrative harmony, as we try to stop those two crazy kids from ending up either dead or as psychotic murder machines. Which one am I talking about? 
That's for you to decide. Of course, it's also important to let players get immersed in playing as a particular character rather than in the story as a whole. One of the best ways a game can do this is via the user interface. Normally, in games, the UI is something layered on top of the game world and is a constant reminder of the artificiality of what we're seeing. But, when a game is able to make the user interface part of the internal world of the game, our brains are much more ready to accept the reality of what's on screen and become more invested in our character's adventure. This is a process that's called diegesis, or to narrate. Essentially, diegetic user interfaces come from the narrative of the game rather than the game itself. One of the best examples of this is Samus's viewpoint in the Metroid Prime games. The game isn't just presented from first person, it's made very clear that everything we see is also what Samus sees. There are a ton of tiny details that help to sell this shared perception, from the way water runs down the screen, to the symbols for the various beams being hand motions Samus has to make, and the way that the visors don't just reveal game elements, but change your entire frame of vision as if you were actually using them. Hell, a significant portion of your perspective is actually blocked by the interior of the suit itself, which is a fantastic touch. Because such a large part of Metroid's identity is the atmosphere and horror element, Retro smartly took advantage of the first-person perspective to increase the authenticity of the world, making your exploration and discoveries feel much more meaningful. Diegetic UI can even be used to more directly enhance the experience of immersive games. In Dead Space, Isaac's suit monitors his vitals, and therefore also shows the player his health and stasis charge. And rather than positioning your ammo totals off to the side in a handy dandy little box, they appear on a holographic display from the gun itself, so that Isaac can see as well. Now, this all works very well for establishing a consistent, atmospheric setting with a firm grasp of its aesthetic, but this approach also has another function. By displaying all the relevant gameplay information on or around Mr. Dead Space himself, the developers know exactly where the player is going to be looking at any given time. When the game wants to ratchet up the tension, it can make something happen on your periphery so you don't get a full look at it. And when Dead Space wants to really scare you, it can have something jump out at Isaac, confident that you won't miss the big moment, and you'll feel just as scared as he does. Unfortunately, making a game immersive in this way can have some downsides. In order to sell a game as immersive, its visuals, controls, and mechanics have to be grounded in fiction in the same way that its geography and characters need to be, and that means sacrificing raw playability. In the Metro games, the Ranger mode, which disables basically all of the UI, is much scarier and tense because it's easier to put yourself in the action when you don't know how many bullets are in your chamber and when you don't know for sure how much time your gas mask has left. However, the fact that it also removes all the button prompts, hints, and a lot of useful details like your crosshair means that Ranger mode is much less fun to play as an actual shooter. This is the central struggle at the heart of mechanical immersion, or immersion that's to do with really getting stuck into the way a game plays. Often the trade-off developers have to make when they pursue a more immersive approach is that the end product is likely to be less intuitive and satisfying on a moment-to-moment -moment level. This is why things like carry limits and weapon durability are such divisive topics. For some players, the frustration these mechanics create outweighs the additional commitment to realism that they offer. Creating a sense of mechanical immersion means walking a delicate tightrope between encouraging a playstyle that's authentic to the game's intended experience and making a game people actually want to keep playing. Faster paced games have the luxury of being able to utilise the flow state. It's easy to lose yourself in the simple pleasures of a racing game or a shooter because they're naturally attention grabbing and give immediate, satisfying feedback. The thrill of downhill mountain biking in Descenders translates well into video game form because of the tangible sense of speed and fine level of control you have over your bike. And it's easy to immerse yourself in the seamless rhythm of Doom's demon blasting dance because of the intuitive way shooting, glory killing, and chainsawing fit together and the endorphin rush you get from pulling each step off. Slower paced, more cerebral games on the other hand have to be a bit more careful. It's hard to feel like a tactical genius or a master of industry if you spend most of your time alternating between fiddling around in menus and waiting around for something interesting to happen. The reason why it's so easy to waste an entire day playing, say, Civilization, is because while the game plays out very slowly, there's always either a new decision to make or a previous decision paying off each turn, ensuring constant engagement without sacrificing the strategic pace of the game. Similarly, in logistics games, it's borderline impossible for your factory to reach 100% efficiency, meaning that even if plonking down lines of furnaces or fiddling with conveyor belts isn't exactly exhilarating gameplay, you still get to live the fantasy of being a master engineer because the fun comes from solving emergent optimization puzzles, of which there are always more to tackle. However, that's not to say that fiddly, clunky, and slow gameplay should always be avoided. 
By leaning into these feelings, developers can create entirely new immersive experiences that simply aren't possible to convey through ultra streamlined or heavily abstracted types of design. Take In Other Waters for example. One of 2020's best games precisely because of the interesting way the player is forced to interact with the world. The entire game is presented from the perspective of a diving suits AI, meaning that, in essence, everything you see and do in In Other Waters is happening in the real main character's minimap. Doing almost anything in In Other Waters is fiddly. Movement requires you to press an awkward series of buttons to scan your next destination and then move to it over and over again. Picking up items involves doing a little mini game where you pull levers and push yet more buttons. Even switching between different tabs of your interface requires, you guessed it, pushing buttons. The low level mechanical experience of In Other Waters is… not very much fun. At times it's downright frustrating. But this is all by design. Because the game requires work simply to navigate and even perceive, with you having to learn that a plus sign is a plant and a cross is an animal all by yourself, your investment in exploring it is rewarded that much more deeply. Over time, your journey of understanding this strange underwater world and its history mirrors your journey of mastering in other waters mechanics, as the fiddly controls slowly become a tactile rhythm and this blanket of yellow dots becomes a rich biological tapestry that's just as visually interesting as a high fidelity graphics card busting set piece. In Other Waters isn't alone here. Other interface driven games like Her Story or Hypnospace Outlaw use deliberately clunky search systems and archaic low quality media to force you to scour the evidence for leads and keep track of interweaving non-linear plot threads without any help. This high level of friction to doing just about anything sets up the mood for some obsessive investigation and some great eureka moments when you triumph in spite of a game that's out to make things deliberately more difficult. The undisputed king of mechanical immersion, of course, is Papers, Please, which simulates the weight of an oppressive faux communist bureaucracy purely through horrible, stressful gameplay. Your workspace will quickly become a cluttered mess, the rules of the game constantly change arbitrarily, preventing you from developing a sense of mastery, and even attempting to personalise your booth is met with swift punishment. In almost any other game, these things will be grounds for criticism. The game is unfair. It is difficult to control and it's definitely repetitive, but this all serves to immerse you in a situation and a perspective that a guns blazing first person shooter or an open world RPG never could. Immersion is one of the most basic pleasures in all of video gaming. That feeling of totally losing yourself in the world of a game can be a great way to relax and unwind, but it can also heighten the drama and tension of a gripping narrative game and suck away hours of your life. But it isn't the be all and end all of video games as some people would have you believe. Mario wouldn't be any more entertaining if the game spent ages trying to get you to experience the same sick pleasure he does when he crushes the Koopa's skull beneath his boots, and the artificial, distinctly video gamey fun of all the best battle royales is predicated on the idea that death isn't worth worrying about and that you shouldn't be thinking too hard about how Wraith can be shooting at herself in Apex Legends or what these Marvel characters are doing in Fortnite. By positioning massive scale photorealism as the only kind of immersion worth bothering about, not only is the conversation unfairly centred on the few developers that can afford to make those kinds of games, we also minimise the accomplishments of developers that do a better job of immersing us in much more interesting ways. With enough man hours, time and processing power, anyone can make a game that looks and feels realistic, but it takes genuine skill and talent for a team to go above and beyond that and get players to become intimately familiar with an entirely different reality and empathise with characters who've lived completely different lives. Immersion is a tricky subject. It's very difficult to describe and talk about a phenomenon which, by its nature, is deeply personal. What gets one person invested into a game might totally break the immersion of someone else. But in any case, I hope this quick dive into immersion has helped you figure out what kinds of immersion work for you and how to better describe this linguistically evasive subject. So, the next time you're really enjoying the feeling of existing inside a video game world, try and think, is this fun coming from the world design, the characters, the way my actions interact with the mechanics, or is it just because someone spent several thousand dollars modelling, rigging and simulating ultra realistic horse balls? Yeah. Hello and welcome to the first after the video bit of 2021. Did not expect to start off with such a long video, but that's just how the cookie crumbles I guess. Oh boy. Anyway, for those who aren't aware, after every video I like to give a special shout out to an awesome internet thing as well as to my top tier patrons for being even more awesome than that. 
So let's start with me pointing you towards the Snowman Footage Archive, a thing set up by fellow YouTuber Brad Grow, aka Snowman Gaming, with a complete archive of all of his footage free for anyone to use. It's an amazing resource and one which I will no doubt be using in future, please check it out and thank him for his generosity. But the real generous people I need to thank are my top tier patrons. If you'd like to join them, just follow the link in the description and throw me some cash to get the same awesome bonuses as these fine people. Who are Alex Deloch, Alex Vieira, Andrew Labrano, Asaran, Ashley Shade, Ausakav, Baxter Heel, Big Chess, Brian Otariani, Constantin Apunkt, Cosmix360, Daniel Metjes, David Setzer, Dirk Jan Karambeld, Ecton, Edward Franklin Woods, Eugene Bulkin, Evie, Philip Magnus, Gazkull, George Sears, Greta Hannison, Jacob Dylan Riddle, Jesse Ryan, Joey Bruno, Jordan Gear, Joshua Binswanger, Kai Gillespie, Lee Berman, Lucas Slack, Lunar Eagle 1996, Mace Window 54, Max Filipov, Nate Graham, WDD, Patrick Romberg, Philby the Bilby, Prospero, Peter Sasbo Daniel, might be pronouncing that wrong, please correct me if I am, Redadex, Regal Regex, Ray's Dad, Samuel Vanderplatz, Sheldon Hearn, Simon Jacobson, Steve Riley, Strateger in Ultima, Tyler Duncan, Zerkane, and Chow. That's it, thanks for bearing with me over my holiday, and I will see you all around very soon. Bye!